kick off a new series this week. What does the Bible say about? And we'll hit some different topics each week. And we're kicking this off with, what does the Bible say about who God loves? We heard in Psalm 72, God loves the righteous, the afflicted, the weak, those who are struggling and suffering. We know from the Old Testament that God stood by the Israelites, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. And as we celebrate Epiphany today, we celebrate Gentiles, non-Jewish people, these Magi who came from the East, coming to worship Jesus, being embraced and accepted. As Paul writes in Ephesians 3, 6, he says... This mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise in Christ Jesus. And then there's John 3.16, which many of us know very well, but let's read that one together. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish. God loves the world, right? At least that's what this says. And as we look around this world, we see and experience God's love. We see God's love in the creation, this world that we have been placed in, that provides for all of our needs. This world of beauty and wonder and majesty and the massiveness of the universe, and yet the incredible tininess of the atoms, the building blocks, that put all of this together. And it's into this world that God placed the first people. We're reminded in Genesis 1 and 2 that God placed Adam and Eve into this world that God created. And God told them that it would provide everything that they needed. And they could eat and enjoy everything in the Garden of Eden except for that one tree, right? Three of the knowledge of good and evil. And Adam and Eve fell into sin. They rebelled against God. They did what they weren't supposed to do as Satan seduced them into it. And they were disciplined. But God continued to love them. God did evict them from the Garden of Eden. But he made clothing for them. And he continued to watch over them. And he continued to watch over his people. Connecting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob, who had those 12 sons, and one of those sons, Joseph, ended up in Egypt, and there was a famine. And Joseph was able to interpret dreams, and he guided the Egyptians so that they could store up grain during the good seasons so they'd have it during the bad seasons. And when Israel was hit with that drought, Joseph's family ended up seeking him out. And Jacob and his sons came, and they settled in Egypt. But then pretty soon, the pharaoh in Egypt discovered that, hey, we have all of these foreign people here. This is like a free labor source. So he enslaved the Israelites. And they were there for 400 years. And finally, they cried out to God for a deliverer. They cried out to God for a redeemer. And what did their God do? What did our God do? He delivered. He sent Moses. He sent Moses to join his brother and his sister Aaron and Miriam there, and they led God's people out of Egypt and led them to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. But even during that trip, the Israelites rebelled against God. They worshipped a golden calf. They got grumpy. They whined. They complained. They were like kids on the car trip. Are we there yet? I'm hungry and thirsty, right? That's the children of Israel. That's us too, by the way. But God disciplined them, but he did not abandon them. And that's the case throughout the rest of the Old Testament. God's people continue to wander, to ebb and flow in their relationship with God. And sometimes God allows a foreign entity to overpower them and capture them, and then God inevitably releases them, sometimes using another foreign entity to do that work. And then by the time we get to the Old Testament, well... There's now 400 years of silence 
between the end of what we have as our Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, and Jesus' birth. The birth of the Messiah, the one who had been promised since the beginning. Since Adam and Eve were evicted out of the garden, there was that promise in Genesis 3 that a descendant of Eve's would crush Satan's hand. And so Jesus lived on this earth, was born, grew up, lived as one of us, and then suffered and died for the sins of the world. It's this Jesus that takes the Ten Commandments that God gave and summarized it into two. In Matthew 22, he says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Reminding us that this God who loves us is one that we get to return that love to. And it's the love of God that flows through us to others in need. Paul speaks about this gift of God's grace and love in Romans 5 8 when he says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing we can do to earn or deserve God's love. God pours it out freely. God pours it out unconditionally with no strings attached. And it's that love that changes us, that shapes us, that forms us, that flows through us. It's that love that the Apostle John writes about in 1 John 4. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. It's God's love that brings us here. And yet we live in a world where the question is raised, does God really love the world? Really? Does God love the world? I believe that. I know many of you believe that. One of the new atheists, Richard Dawkins, wrote this in the God in his book, The God Delusion. And this is a quote that pops up a lot. Um, you can put it in and see where it shows up all over the internet. He writes, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. That's what he thinks of God. As he reads the Old Testament, that's what he comes to. And there are many in our culture who buy into this view of who God is. And they do ask the question, does God really love the world? was chatting with a, a restaurant worker a few weeks ago, and he said, I think I'm the only Christian that works in this restaurant. He said, the people here like me, they embrace me, they're, they're nice to me, but they do tell me that they think my God is me. So there's that roadblock that exists in our world. And looking at the Old Testament especially, through the eyes of this quote, when we see the flood, right? Where God wiped the world clean, completely obliterated everything on the planet, saving eight people, Noah, his wife, their three sons and their wives, and seven of every unclean animal and two of every clean, I might have that backwards, feel free to fact check it. But everything else got destroyed and God started over. Now, the condition of the world at that time was it was so wicked, so evil, so disgusted God that he figured he needed to reboot. And so he found a family that he could start over with. But he did destroy the world 
And then he gives us the rainbow as a reminder that he will never destroy it completely with a flood ever again. Then we have Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities that were wiped out. And as the prophet Ezekiel writes about them, he says, Now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore I did away with them, as you have seen. God didn't appreciate their arrogance, their lack of concern for those who were poor and needy, their pride and the detestable things that they did. We have a righteous, holy God. A God who is good from his core all the way out. And he struggles with unrighteousness. He struggles with wickedness. He struggles with the gross, bad stuff that people do in this world. And then we have God wiping out the enemies of Israel. Some atheists will compare that to the Holocaust. They'll say, you know what? Hitler wiped out a million Jewish children, two million Jewish women, and three million Jewish men. He experimented on them. He treated them as animals. How is God any different when he tells his people to go in and kick out all the Canaanites, all the Amorites, all the Hittites, all the Girgashites, all those ites people? Right? How is God different? The reality is those people were more like Hitler. They didn't just gross, detestable, nasty stuff. The Canaanites were known for sacrificing children. They were known for promoting incest, ritual, uh, ritual prostitution, bestiality, and all sorts of other things that most people in this world would say, that's nasty stuff. And that's what they were pushing. And God didn't want his people infected with that. And he didn't want it to exist anymore. And so he guided his people to do what needed to be done and use them as an agent to bring justice on the earth. In 1 Samuel 15, 3, we hear these words. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children and infants, cattle and sheep, camels and donkeys. Tough verse to read. Isn't it? A tough verse to read that a loving God would do this. And yet somehow, in his love for this world, he did not see another way. Ironically, the Canaanites were supposedly totally wiped out. It's been discovered that uh, some of their descendants via DNA are living in Lebanon right now. So if you want to go find some Canaanites, you can go to Lebanon. I don't think they're doing the stuff that God invited them for here, thankfully. And that's where I think the Old Testament uses some hyperbole as well. Get rid of all of them. You know, in, in my fantasy world, the Broncos will soundly defeat the Chiefs today, like 51 to 14. And if that happens, I will say they killed them. But I'll be speaking metaphorically, right? I'll be using hyperbole. They won't literally kill them. And I think we find that in some of these Old Testament narratives. Where they completely annihilated, completely destroyed them. I think it's another way of them saying they had a large victory. But there's still the bloodshed, there's still the war. But it's again the result of the same things that God sent the flood for. It's a result of the same things that God got rid of Sodom and Gomorrah for. It's a result of the same things that are in this world now that God doesn't like any more than he did now. We live in a broken, messed up world. And yet in the midst of this, God does speak these words to his people about the foreigners, about those other people that might be living among them. In Leviticus 19, verses 33 and 34, he says, When a foreigner resides among you in your land, do not mistreat them. The foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. 
So it wasn't that God was against everybody who wasn't an Israelite. He told the Israelites to be kind to those that were brought near them. And to live out their faith in that loving way. There's still the question, though, of, you know, how do we know something is good or bad? How do we know something is detestable or righteous? C.S. Lewis, who was raised a Christian, became an atheist, and then God brought back to Christianity, wrote this in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, my argument against God was that the universe seemed so cruel and unjust. But, had I got this, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? It is God who still plants in the hearts of all people his desire for holiness, righteousness, and goodness. And it's that desire that continues to live in our world. And it's that desire that we can continue to live out. So who does God love? He, he loves the world. As we're reminded in Psalm 145, verse 8, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. He's gracious, he's compassionate, slow to anger, and rich in love. And slow to anger, by the way, the Canaanites had been living there for several hundred years before God brought the Israelites in. God gave them a long runway to try to straighten things out. And they continued down that deep, dark path that they were on. We see God's love and his promise to Abraham. As he promises to make him a father of many nations. As he promises to bless those who bless Abraham. And to protect Abraham by cursing those who curse him. We see God's love as we revisit Jesus' family tree. The family tree that we visited on Christmas Eve in Matthew 1. It's not A-listers who have their life together that are in the family tree. I mean, that group of folks is a hot mess, to put it mildly. And yet God chose for his son to be born in that line, in that line of those kinds of people, knowing that we too can be like those kinds of people. God's love is shown to the Magi as he revealed to them that this star led to his son, the king of creation. The Magi were astrologers, among other things. They were probably from Persia. They may have been Zoroastrians. Uh, ironically, the Zoroastrian faith also has a virgin birth narrative in it. And they saw that the star says, King's born, so let's go. Let's go honor this king. And God guided them. God spoke to them. God continued to bless them on their journey. And provided for the Holy Family in that process, providing for Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. As Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And Jesus paves that way for us to be with God forever. As we celebrate this time of year, he is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So what about us? What about you? What about me? God loves you and God loves me. He accepts us as we are. But in his compassion, in his grace, in his goodness, in his love, he chooses not to leave us there. Like a parent, there are times where God grows us, where God guides us, where God disciples us, and sometimes where God disciplines us. But ultimately, it is God who sent his, sends his son into the world. And we meet our God at the cross when God takes his own wrath for this world out on himself. As Jesus, God's perfect son, dies for the sins of the world before coming back to life again. The old covenant collides with the new covenant. And love wins. God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not be destroyed or perish, but have eternal life. Those are the promises we cling to. Those are the promises we get to live. As we get to live, the love that God continues to show us 
and continues to show all the people in this world, even those who struggle to see it or receive it. Amen. A question for you to ponder. If someone challenged you about God being loving, how would you answer? And I do put a reminder there that Peter encourages us to share the hope that we have with gentleness and respect. I don't know about you, but it's not always easy for me to come back with that. So, um, it's a regular reminder. But yeah, think on that. If someone challenged you about God being loving, how would you answer? How have you experienced God's love in your life?